most of us are interested in the social world. We're critical realists because we're interested in the social world. And, and so uh, the question of how our philosophy of causal powers applies to the social world is one that's of central interest to us. And that's uh, what I want to focus on today, but also on a um, rather contentious issue, I think, which is the question of how does the social relate to the material. There's a perception, at least, and I think it's true in some areas of the social sciences, that there has been a tendency to think of the social <coughs> world as non-material, as if there was a social material that could be dualistically separated from the material world itself, um, which is an idea that's been common, perhaps even hegemonic in some of the social sciences, it's perhaps encouraged by views like constructionism, and it's famously been the target of uh, Latour's actor network theory, you know, which has created uh, a sense of uh, innovation and originality and importance for itself by accusing everybody else of taking a dualistic approach to the social and the material. Um, I think the critique is overdone because I'm not sure that the whole of the rest of social science is guilty of the crime as charged. Um, but there has been a tendency to think in those terms in sociology, in my discipline. Um, so how might we respond to that? Well, um, clearly we're talking about things like the social and the material. We're talking about what sorts of things exist in the world. We're talking about ontology. So I'll say a little bit about critical realist approach to ontology, um, but then move on to say more about social things, what's particular about social things, and then on to say a little about how that might relate to uh, the question of the material. Okay, so you're all here because you know something about critical realism, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time re-explaining critical realists um, views on ontology, um, but there are variations on the theme, different critical realists have slightly different takes, so I'm going to just very briefly outline the one that I'm working with, um, which can be summarised like this. The world um, is full of things, um, which we can, um, we can think of as being separate into different types of things, and the members of any particular type of things have characteristic causal powers, which are a product of um, mechanisms of interaction between the parts of the thing concerned. So, um, for example, you know, dogs have the power to bark, which arises from the sorts of parts that are combined in dogs and the ways in which they interact you know, in order to produce a bark. You know, clocks have, these old-fashioned <coughs> clocks, um, have a characteristic set of parts which interact in a certain way to produce the clock's power to keep time, um, etc., etc. We could multiply examples endlessly. And so if we have a world in which, which is populated by things with causal powers, then the events that occur in that world on this account are produced by the interactions of multiple causal powers. So any particular event um, is multiply determined in the sense that there are always many different powers that interact to produce an event, and also contingent in the sense that the uh, the particular mix of causal powers that uh, comes together at that point um, could have been different. Uh, there could have been other combinations that, that occurred, and there's no particular guarantee that you know, that particular combination of powers will reoccur at some point in the future. Okay, so that's... Um, uh, a pretty non-social story so far, and what I want to focus on more is what happens when we try to apply that way of thinking about causation to the social world. Um, uh, 
except I'm <laughs> got confused about the sequence of my presentation. Actually, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. So what I want to do before I do that is say something about uh, the material side of my story. Um, because clearly if we're talking about dogs and clocks and those sorts of objects, including you know, natural objects and um, humanly created objects, we're talking about material things in a fairly simple and obvious <coughs> sense of the word. Um, and I want to argue that this materialist um, approach should also be applied to the social. But to do that, I, I need to say a little bit about what I mean by materialism. Um, and this is, a, this is a quote from my blog. Um, it's a very rough and ready definition of materialism. Um, everything that exists and has causal effects. So this is the, the, the sort of topic area that I'm trying to define as being material. Is composed of physical particles. So that's what I think it is to be material, but to cater for the case of what happens down below, quarks or whatever the bottom there is, all, all composes physical particles. But we can ignore that bit for, for the purposes of the social world. Um, so now if we start to think about how that might apply to the social world, then we can see there are various classes of things, and um, each of these I'm going to argue is material. Well, first of all, it's un, you know, un, um, uncontroversial. Um, ordinary material objects like trees and iPads and iPhones and chairs, and tables, the traditional things that we must talk about, obviously material. Um, but also, and, and this is where we start to confront issues in the social sciences, people are material. And sometimes the social sciences have, have seemed to kind of push that aside, ignore it, maybe even in extreme cases deny it by talking about subjects or agents in terms that neglect the materiality of people. But one thing that I want to insist on, um, and again, I don't think this is problematic for realists, or any realists I know of, um, is that our subjectivity, our agency, is a consequence of our materiality and the, you know, the properties that we have as a result of the way our parts are put together in just the same way that a dog's capacity to bark is a product of the capacities it has as a, way of, a result of the way its parts are put together. Um, where the issue is perhaps more challenging is when we talk about the sort of third class of things with powers that interact to produce social events, and that is social entities, um, such as organisations and queues, for example. Uh, and as a first approximation, I want to say that social entities are things composed of people. People are material, social entities are therefore also material according to my definition, uh, although material in a different sort of way perhaps than we're accustomed to thinking about. Um, and I've argued elsewhere that when we talk about social structure and the powers of social structure, then what we're really talking about is the powers of social entities like these. <clears throat> so, if all of that is true, then um, we've cashed out that claim that I started with, that um, social causation is a product of interactions between material things. However, although social things are material, I want to say that they're a different kind of material thing than ordinary objects like dogs and clocks. And the reason for that is that the, the relations that structure these things are um, not spatial, not directly spatial in the sense that the relation between the, you know, the parts of the dog or the parts of the clock are very much spatially specific. And that's possible because of intentionality. You know, we can relate to each other in ways that aren't dependent on our you know, exact physical relation, spatial relation to each other, because we have minds, we have the capacity to um, 
make commitments to each other, for example, to form beliefs about each other. And therefore, we have the capacity to interact with each other in systematic ways that depend on our intentional states and not just on our spatial relations to each other. And you know, so, for example, um, Q, you know, Q has the capacity, the causal power to serialize access to a resource amongst a group of people, and that depends on the fact that um, the people who form the queue um, have some understanding about the norms of queuing and um, a recognition of their place in the queue. So these are intentional relations um, between the people concerned. Um, and this has a couple of interesting consequences. One is that the, um, the function of these social objects um, isn't spatially constrained in the way that the function of ordinary material objects is. So organizations can still function perfectly well, even though the people who make up the organization are distributed in you know, a whole variety of spatial ways. Um, you know, the sales team for a company might be traveling out across the world, doesn't stop them being part of the organization. And that ability to be kind of spatially disarticulated and still remain the part of a social entity also means that people can be parts of more than one at the same time. You know, a cog can only be part of one clock at the same time. You know, a, you know, a windpipe can only be part of one dog. But a person can be a part of multiple different organizations at one and the same time. So social things are different than ordinary material things, even though they are a sort of subclass of material things. Um, and the other thing I want to say in my last two minutes is that um, there's a <coughs> further aspect to the materiality of social structure which has generally been ignored, um, not universally again, I don't want to commit the tour's error, um, and that is that social things usually have non-human material parts as well as the human material parts. Um, and, and I've illustrated that at a toy example. I think of a string quartet. The string quartet has the power to produce beautiful music. The parts of a string quartet are musicians, but also instruments. You know, the string quartet just does not have that power unless you have both the musicians and the instruments. So here's a social entity with a causal power that depends on both people and material parts. That's a toy example, but the same argument applies equally to almost every important social structure in the world that we inhabit. Cities, uh, manufacturing companies, uh, navigation systems is a great book by Edwin Hutchins called uh, Cognition in the Wild, which really illustrates this argument very nicely, although I'm taking it in a slightly different direction than he did. And so these, the world that we, popul that, that we exist in is populated very much by these kind of complex entities. And we, as social scientists, have often neglected that material aspect of social structure, and, and it's something that we need to pay much more attention to. Um, I think there are some interesting things we could say about the different roles that humans and um, material parts play in these uh, larger social entities, but I'm going to skip over that um, and just wind up uh, by summarizing, summarizing rather the, the key things that I've been trying to say. You know, the social, first of all, is not immaterial. It's not somehow just separate from the material world. The social is very much part of the material world. Um, it consists of entities as material parts, um, which are different, at least the social entities themselves are different 
in an interesting way from ordinary material objects and yet they are still a kind of material object and we neglect that materiality at our time.